Hi AP Econ students, Mr. Muller here, and in today's video, which is the last video in our third unit on the theory of the firm, we're going to be talking about the last type of firm market structure that can exist, an oligopoly, and we're going to be talking about the strategic behavior of firms, whether it's in a oligopoly or a, or a monopolistic competitive market. And so we're going to be talking about how firms make the decisions that they make on the price of goods. Hope you're excited. I'm excited. Let's get started. So let's talk about what the technical term for oligopoly is, is a form of market structure that exists when a small number of firms sell, uh, sell a differentiated product like a monopolistic competitive market in a market with high barriers to entry. So whereas monopolistic competitive market has easy barriers to entry, oligopoly has difficult barriers to entry because of how much, because of how much money or infrastructure you have to invest to join the market. And it's a smaller number than a monopolistic competitive market. Because of that, it has more market power in setting the price of a good or service. Not as much as a monopoly, because remember, a monopoly, it's one business. In oligopoly, it's only a few. So they don't have as much power as, as a monopoly, but they do have more power than a monopolistic competitive market. Now, what economists do is they use concentration, concentration ratios to measure how much power an oligopoly has. Now, what they do is they take the top four firms for that particular market, and then they um, look at how much of the market structure those four companies control to measure the concentration ratios. The higher concentration ratio, the stronger the oligopoly is. It is a fairly rough gauge because you also, now with the globalization, you have to account for international competition, but that's typically what economists do. So this is a little bit of a chart. I love this chart because it shows you the difference of all these market structures we've been talking about. Just make a note of them and then let's move on. So here is a concentration ratio. Now we're using the US just because this is a particular use from the textbook, but these things can, can apply to any country. For instance, if we're looking at cell phone services in the US, here are our top four. Whereas if, if you're in a different country, it might be Zane and Orange. So if you notice, a lot of countries have these typical structures. Also, things like soda production. These are the top four, mostly the top four in most countries. So these are things like search engines that you're familiar with. These are the different types of famous oligopolies and industries that exist in the world. So if you are a business that is situated in an oligopoly, your goal as a firm is to become a monopoly. You want to be the only business in your um, field but mostly you end up acting like you're in a monopolistic competition because you have differentiated products and you need to do some advertising because you need to differentiate what you're selling than the three or four other firms in your particular market. Now, one thing about oligopolies is they cannot collude. And then collusion is basically an agreement between some of those firms to set their own prices and their own quantities. So it would be as if Verizon and AT&T or Zane and Orange got together and said, "Here's we're going to set the prices and we're going to make them the same and we're going to set the quantity. Basically, they form a monopoly together. When they do that, they become a cartel. And countries use antitrust laws to prevent that from happening. Now, why would those businesses want to do that? Because if they can all agree on the price and the quantity, they can guarantee production and revenue, and they're basically acting like a monopoly. They just all form and merge together into a monopoly. Oligopolies are also in a state of mutual in interdependence. They really depend on one another, and their actions have to reflect what the others are doing. So if one firm, let's say for cell phone companies, right, if one firm offers a more attractive package, the other cell phone firms have to do the same because if they don't, because of their differentiated product, you're going to have more consumers go to that cell phone company. So they really do a, a similar strategy. If one does one thing, the other will do another thing because there are only a few options. So let's look at a demand schedule in, in this instance for cell phones. Now, if you are a monopoly, your goal is to get the highest total revenue. So if you are a monopoly, you would sell your cell phone plan for 90 JD or $90 or 90 euros a month. You'd, your target would be about 600 customers because your total revenue would be 54,000 JD dollars euros. So if you're a monopoly, this is what you want. If this was a perfect competitive market, you would actually have a total profit of zero. So you would actually have your price at zero dollars. But again, that's not going to happen. Um, it'd be really 
odd to have a cell phone com perfect competitive market. But in oligopoly, you're going to have a range of prices starting at the highest total revenue and then working its way down. Now, why would you say, wait a second, Mr. Mueller, why don't they just raise the price? Why is it they have to work from 90 JD dollars, euros down to uh, down instead of working up? Well, if I was in an oligopoly like Zane, Orange, AT&T, Verizon, if I raise my price, even though I'd make the same amount of revenue here as 75, my competitors will just keep it low and people will go there. So you can't keep it above that highest total revenue um, section. So here's a outcome of that demand of that supply schedule based on those three markets. It's a summary of what I just said. You can make a couple of notes, pause the video and look at how that works. Now duopoly means it, it, it's only two firms in the industry. Oligopolies, uh, oligopolies would also follow this behavior. So now we're going to talk about some economic theory. Uh, I love this this idea. This is called the Nash Equilibrium. Uh, John Nash, who is a Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, if you ever watched the movie A Beautiful Mind starring Russell Crowe, he used to be a really big actor back in the early 2000s. Um, this is a story about him. Really interesting story, but not completely true. But John Nash's uh, theory was that all economic decision makers, all the people who make those decisions in different firms, will opt to keep the status quo. You don't want to do anything that will rock the boat too much because that could hit your profit margins. And so in a Nash equilibrium, the idea is just keep everything going the way it is. Because if there's too much fluctuation in a market, that's going to affect our overall profits. And that's why how equilibrium happens in oligopolies. You don't want to do anything too disruptive or too crazy or do a crazy marketing strategy. That will upset the equilibrium. When an oligopoly has more than two firms in the industry, there is more competition on price and the market becomes more competitive. If the, you can compare cell phone companies in different countries, if you have two, there's not a lot of options. Whereas in some countries, there's four, five, six. Some cell phone companies offer really good packages, but they only work in certain cities. So the more you have uh, firms you have in an oligopoly, the more competition there'll be on price. And the price and output effect make it difficult for cartels to operate. The more firms you have in there that are offering different prices, that's going to be harder for oligopolies to collude and become cartels. Now, there are two different effects. A price effect is how a change in the price affects the firm's revenue. An output effect occurs when a change in the price affects the number of customers in a market. So if a change in price happens, some people might leave your firm or join your firm if you're changing your prices. And the idea is as the number of firms grow, they become less concerned about the impact of the overall price. They just want to keep the customers that they have and bring in more customers. So they're not... Uh, becoming concerned about the price of their good. They're making sure that they're having a strong market share. So let's talk a little bit more about um, economic theory and strategies. So here's a theory called game theory. And it's a branch of mathematics that economists use to analyze the strategic behavior of decision makers. So it's difficult in a humanity sense to analyze the decisions that people who run firms make. So a better way to analyze it is make it mathematical. And this can let economics pre uh, economists predict what level of cooperation is most likely co to occur. So if I am a, the owner of a cell phone company, let's say I am the cell phone owner of Zane, and I want to make sure that I am constantly competing with the other firms in the oligopoly, I have to predict what they're going to do, and I have to predict how I'm going to respond to that. Now, we call this situation a prisoner's dilemma. Now, here's, here's a great way to describe a prisoner's dilemma. You and one of your friends are accused of cheating. You get brought into the headmaster's or the dean's or the principal's office, and they say, okay, we know, we know you cheated, but we don't know which one of you had the original. But, but here's what's going to happen. It's like, if you rat, so they put you in different offices, right? And let's say you're sitting in front of the dean. They say, if you tell me who actually cheated and copied the work, then they're going to get in trouble, but you won't. And they say that to the other person. Now, what they're hoping is one person rats on the other. But, the, but here's the thing. If you both rat on each other, you're both going to get hit with a harsh penalty. But if both of you shut up and don't say anything... You're, you're both going to be punished, but the sentence is going to be minimal because they can't quite prove what they're looking for. 
So in a prisoner's dilemma, the idea is both of you want to shut up and not say anything, but because you're in separate rooms and getting, and getting pressure, one of you might rat on the other. But if you rat on that person, you also got to hope they don't rat on you, so that way you both get the harsh punishment. That's the prisoner's dilemma. Now, there are a lot of ways to play this game. In fact, there, are, there have been um, dozens, if not hundreds, of strategies that economists and mathematicians have created to analyze the prisoner's dilemma. This is also a dilemma that happens in political science and international relations. And whatever strategy you use, you call that the dominant strategy for your firm. When you think, okay, if this firm does this, this is how I'm going to react. And this is how you can organize a prisoner's dilemma. So let's talk about cell phone companies. Instead of uh, Verizon and AT phone, let's just call this Zane and Orange or AT&T and Verizon. So the idea is how many customers are we going to want? Now, if we both have a lower number of customers, we're going to have the highest amount of revenue. So we'll both make out. But what if one of those cell phone companies is trying to adjust the amount of customers they have and, and uh, violate the Nash equilibrium and change the status quo? Well, if, if let's say Zane changes their customer base to 400 customers, they'll get more revenue and it'll impact Orange. But if Orange also tries to go 400 customers, you're both going to lose out So the uh, because you're going to be offering lower prices for your product. So the goal is keep the equilibrium and don't do anything to the market. But the problem is because firms always want to have the most profit possible, they're going to try and do strategies that will impact their revenue and hope you don't notice it or you don't retaliate. So how does advertising play a role in this? Um, because... Firms want to differentiate their product and get more, a larger percentage of the market share. They do advertise, but the idea is you really don't want to. You don't want to have to advertise because that raises your average total cost as we looked at when we looked at a, a monopolistic competitive market. But comp uh, advertising, if you do it and your competitors don't, that actually helps you. But the problem is, if your competitors also do it, that creates an equilibrium and it doesn't actually work. So do we advertise and how much money do we put in advertising is a really difficult cons, uh, really difficult strategy to think about if you're owning a firm. Now, how do you solve the prisoner's dilemma? What's the, the best dominant strategy to do this in? And there's a great podcast on Planet Money about this. I really suggest uh, watching it. You just go to subscribe to the podcast Planet Money and you search for their um, for their podcast on game theory and the prisoner's dilemma. And there was a big study done on this. And what they determined, and, and they did multiple rounds of this. They created a computer algorithm that had different strategies play each other. And they said the best strategy is something called a tit-for-tat strategy, which means I am not going to change my behavior and keep the equilibrium, but if you do something... I'm going to do it right back to you. So if you don't do anything to me, I won't do anything to you. I'll keep equilibrium. I'm not going to upset the apple cart, which is a strange phrase. I'm not going to upset the equilibrium we have. But if you do something, I'm retaliating. Now, what's interesting is not only was this strategy the most successful when they ran these um, computer algorithms, but they also found that this that strategy doesn't really work in a real-life situation. Because if you do that... You could have an escalation where both businesses can go out of, out, out of business because they'll both just keep altering strategies and spending more money and raising their average total cost. So how this really should work is you have a tit-for-tat strategy, but sometimes you don't retaliate it is really how the best strategy for the prisoners on that is. That's a basic summary of the podcast, but check it out. They do a really good job explaining it. So... When you are running a firm and you're trying to figure out, well, if we want to keep equilibrium, but I don't know what my competitors are going to do, what you have to figure out and what you run is something called backwards induction, which you think about what is the end goal for my competing firms and what are all the different ways they could get to their ultimate end goal, maybe a certain uh, amount of profit margins or adding a certain amount of customers or having a certain percentage of the, of the market share. And what you do is you make a decision tree. You say, here's their end goal, and what are all the different ways they could get to that end goal? So you backwards in, you use backwards induction. In teaching, we call this um, uh, um, backwards learning. Uh, we actually use this theory as well to plan lessons. 
And so what you do is when you find all of those decision trees, you're able to predict what your competitors can do and all the decisions they could make so you can react to them. But it's not fully accurate in business. It's more like rock, paper, scissors. There's no, even though tit for tat is the most optimal strategy in a real world situation, you want to use a decision tree and use backwards induction to try to get a step ahead so that you can predict what they're going to do and be prepared to react to that. What's the best way? Do we retaliate? Do we not? And that's how game theory and strategic behavior works. So in this case, uh, the prisoner's dilemma in economics is really more about playing tennis or ping pong. You're trying to guess what your, or, or it's penalty kicks in soccer, right? You're trying to guess, let's use soccer. Um, you're trying to guess, or football if you're international, sorry, or unless you're in the U.S. or Australia, because U.S. and Australia, they both call it soccer. Regardless, if you're doing penalty kicks, you're the goalkeeper. You're trying to predict which way are they going to kick that ball, straight, to the right, or to my left. And you're guessing which way they go depending on the, the other strategies they've used in the past. That's a little bit more like what it is in, in an economics prisoner dilemma. You don't exactly know, but you can use backwards induction to figure out which way they're most likely going to go. And you try to guess it. And if you do that, that's how you can become successful in business. That's not always the case, but you're also kind of guessing what your opponent's going to do a lot and the strategy you'll use to counter that. So... How do governments make sure that collusion and cartels don't occur? Um, there are, these are three different uh, ideas. I'm not going to read them out because they're very U.S.-centric. It's important to know them in case you get a, asked a question on this on the AP test, but just read them, know them. And that is all we have for our third unit on the theory of the firm and looking at oligopolies. Hope you learned something you didn't know before. Thanks for watching.